putting on the whole armor of God. So rather than starting there, take your Bibles and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And uh, like I said a few moments ago, we, we've been on this long enough, just to, that picture is enough to teach um, the, the armor that God has given us against the wiles of the devil. And we're studying uh, the mystery of iniquity, how Satan is operating in the age of grace. And, and so by God giving us a defense, we realize what he's defending us against, these attacks of the devil. And we actually only got through one last week. We were supposed to cover all of them. And then today I wanted to conclude with the, the parts of the body, just some verses that, uh, that show that, the, that these pieces of armor protect certain parts of the body that have a certain uh, spiritual uh, implication to them. But uh, we're going to cover both of those today and, and, and finish up at least this section in Ephesians. So we were talking about in Ephesians that God has, we're, we're to be girt about with truth, a breastplate of righteousness, shoes with the, uh, the preparation of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith and the helmet which is the hope of salvation. And that uh, those things protect us from the, what, the, what it said, the wiles of the devil. So certainly, if we're protected by truth, Satan operates under the lie. And he's got many lies. <laughs> so that there's all kinds of ways that he, he pushes the lie program. Uh, righteousness, the breastplate of righteousness, is certainly to understand Christ's righteousness. And Satan's attack is certainly sin, but it's also... It's not only would Satan attack you to get, live a life of sin and carnality, but he would also try to attack a believer in the sense of standing in their own righteousness. And you'll see both of those as we look at this here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and, and we don't have to spend much time because you realize that when we were talking, what we've done in talking about the mystery of iniquity is I just took all of Paul's epistles where he mentions... Satan, the devil, or devils, and, uh, and realize the warnings that he's given to the saints, and so therefore those warnings would cover all the attacks of the devil. Most of it, like Ephesians 5, is really one place you could have went and covered them all. Because when we're talking about sin here, we already talked about the fact that uh, one of the attacks of Satan is carnality. And, uh, and we've already talked about the fact that one of the attacks of Satan is on the gospel. And we learned those from Corinthians, and now we have come over to Ephesians. So we've really talked about sin and, and uh, the attack on the gospel, uh, preaching another gospel. And, and yet they're, here they are again in Ephesians. What's interesting is, is when you get to the last two, the false doctrine and the, and the hope of salvation, the the fear and despair that Satan would try to put in your mind that you would operate under fear and despair rather than live in the hope of the gospel, those are yet epistles that follow the book of Ephesians. And uh, so we won't spend a whole lot of time on there either because we're going to cover them yet uh, a second time. And we've looked at, like in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 3, it says, for ye, for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? That understanding, to walk as, as men. Certainly Satan wants, like the, Christ, the Corinthians had problems with, with living in sin, operating because they were carnal. They didn't have God's word working in their minds and their hearts, and so... They were living their life from a worldly point of view, and, uh, and Paul says they're carnal. They walk as men. They walk as lost people because they either aren't operating under the truth of God's word and, uh, or they haven't had enough God's word in them. That's why the verses above talked about, uh, uh, like in verse 1, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as babes in Christ. Well, babe in Christ doesn't have much of God's word in him to operate on. So naturally, he's carnal because he's a babe. But the Corinthians, they're carnal, but they're not babes. They've been saved a while, but they're not spiritual. That is, they're not taking God's word and living according to God's word, but they're walking as men. And so certainly, that's where Satan would certainly attack. Not only does he attack the truth, but he attacks by people living and operating in the flesh. And, uh, 
And, and that way at least it destroys your testimony as you try to share the gospel with someone else. But there's another way that Satan attacks in the way of sin. Come over to Galatians chapter 3. Because the Galatians, they're not carnal in the sense of living in the flesh, but they are carnal in the sense that, well, you see in, in chapter 3 what, what they're doing. Galatians 3 verse 1, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? And by the way, I think Galatians is one of the books where Paul doesn't mention Satan or the devil, but he does talk about uh, the we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you. And we know that's one of the ways Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Uh, and then here, this word bewitched, there, you talk about the wiles of the devil. There is saints, uh, Paul's looking at the false teaching that the Galatians are operating under as if it's demonic, as if it's black magic. <laughs> it says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was evidently set forth and crucif uh, set forth crucified among you. This only what I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have, have, have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He that ministereth unto you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, and this is an early epistle of Paul, while miraculous things were happening, doth he hit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? And then he talks, talking about Abraham being justified by faith. The Galatians, they're under the impression that they're, and this is where you can actually take this one and this one and move them together, is they're operating under the, under the sense that they're saved by grace, but they serve under the law, or they're made complete under the law. That, that the, the, the grace of God and faith wasn't enough. They needed more. And so the, the, the problem in, in Galatia was circumcision. And Paul here is saying, are you so foolish, having begun in the faith, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Well, that's, there's two ways Satan gets people operating in the flesh. Either they live after the flesh, that is, the lust of the flesh they follow. Remember we, when we studied even the lie of Satan there and the temptation of Christ, that's all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those are all things that Satan would try to get you to operate under and certainly to follow the lust of the flesh. Just to live a sinful lifestyle is one of the attacks of the devil. But the other is self-righteousness. And that is, rather than righteousness that's a fruit of righteousness as a result of spiritual growth, it's a pseudo-righteousness. It's a, it's a religious righteousness where people are operating in the flesh and trying to produce their own righteousness but that's really just sin. That their righteousness is just is uh, filthy rags before God. So one of the ways of Satan operating in sin is he takes that lie and and makes people think, now nah, you're made perfect by what you do, and uh, and then try to get people operating in the flesh. And that's what the Galatians were. When you read the book of Galatians, sometimes I keep going back and forth because, like when he says, like, look back at chapter one. Verse 6 tells us that they were first saved by grace. And even chapter 3, are you so foolish having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? So they began in the spirit, now they're going to operate in the flesh. Chapter 1, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of, God, of Christ, into the grace of Christ, unto another gospel, which is not another. But there some, be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As I said before, so say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which he have received, let him be accursed. <laughs> so they first received the gospel, but now they're going to operate under another gospel, which is circumcision as you go through the passage there. They're, they think that that's going to make them complete before God. Something in the flesh is going to cause them to be complete. And so now they're not going to uh, stay in the truth of the gospel, but they're going to operate in the flesh. And that's just another way of Satan attacking. And, uh, and like I say, 
when you read Galatians, it, it's clear they, they, you know, Paul established them, so they, they did hear the right message when they first believed, and now they got away from it from false teachers. But anyone who tries to even uh, do works in order to be saved, go, go to that Galatians 5. I know I've shared this with you before. I, I know that the context here is a believer falling from grace, not letting grace operate in his life, and he's going to let the flesh operate in his life and think that's going to be acceptable with God. But at the same time, if someone, the, the phrase about being justified by, by, the, by works, that anyhow, it says in, in Galatians chapter 5 in verse 3, I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he, uh, that he is a debtor to the whole law. Christ, now here, look at this, Christ is become of no effect unto you, Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Well, so they were in grace, and fallen from grace doesn't, you know, some people look at that and say, oh, they lost their salvation. No, grace is what operates, grace is what motivates, grace is what empowers, and, if, and, and grace is how to walk after the Spirit. And if they're going to now walk after their flesh, if they're going to try to do things in flesh and operate in the flesh, they've fallen from grace. That, that is, when it says Christ of no effect unto you, it's not the life of Christ. It's the, your life. <laughs> Remember, for me to live is Christ, but if you're going to operate in the flesh, for you to live is you. And uh, so there's no effect of Christ. They're fallen from grace. Verse 5 says, for, for, for we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness, which is by faith. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. So these people are trying to operate on the, on the basis of works rather than the, on the basis of grace. Then what they're doing is, if you look over in verse 16, it says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So you don't, the Christian life isn't controlling the flesh. The Christian life is walking after the Spirit. And when you walk after the Spirit, you, you, don't, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. And then down in verse 22, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. So if you walk after the Spirit and you have the fruit of the Spirit, that's, that's totally different than you walking around in your own righteousness. And I, I keep pointing to sin because that Satan is going to either try to get you to live carnally uh, in sin or try to get you to live your Christian life in the flesh. Verse 24, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. <laughs> let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. So Satan's attack is certainly to get us to operate in the flesh, which is nothing but sin. And part of that attack, as we just already saw, it's an attack against the gospel, because the gospel is how you begin and how you ought to continue to walk. And we, when I put the word subtlety here, we have already studied 2 Corinthians chapter 11, where Paul was, was concerned that the Corinthians, that a man that as Satan beguiled Eve, so they would be beguiled through the, from the simplicity that is in Christ, that if another come along and preach another spirit, another gospel, another Jesus, they would, and I don't think I said that in the right order, anyhow, that they would follow him. And so Satan's attack is certainly on the gospel and the gospel of peace because think about this. If you're, going to live, if you're going to live the Christian life, if Satan could get Christians to think, oh, I've sinned, therefore I've lost my salvation. There's not, only, not only does Satan get Christians to think that they can lose salvation, and remember, the shoes, the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, is to have the shoes on so that if you're in warfare, you don't slip, you can take a stand. The preparation of the gospel of peace is established in the gospel, unmovable. Well, Satan's got Christians trying to get saved over and over again, worried about losing salvation. They're not stable. He's got them knocking them around. The other thing is, is when I was in Bible college and all, they always talked about someone being put on the shelf. You've done something wrong, you're disqualified from the service of God, God puts you on the shelf. And I, I used to believe that, and then realize, hey, that's one of those lies of Satan. 
Now, you ought to put away the sin. If you're living in sin, you're not, you're not meat for the master's use. So you need to put away the sin. But you put away the sin and you realize grace covers it all. The blood of Christ covers it all. And don't let Satan say, well, I'm on the shelf the rest of my life. I have no more service for God. That's what Satan would want you to believe. But that's not being established in the, the truth of the gospel. And so Satan's attack is there. Now, his attack is also on the shield of faith. And we talked about faith. Truth is God's word to us. Faith is us standing behind it. It's getting a hold of the truth of God and standing behind it. Now, those things we're going to see more in the next couple, couple weeks. But let's look at a couple of those. Come over to 1 Timothy. He says in verse 1, 1 Timothy chapter 1, no, verse 3. He says, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to, to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions, rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. Godly edifying is to bring people into faith, sound doctrine. Don't teach any other doctrine other than the doctrine of grace. And as you look at that, they're going to, there's, there's people that are going to teach fables, genealogies. Later on it says, uh, um, uh, uh, verse uh, 7, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. So they... They get away from uh, faith. There's a, verse 5 even says, uh, And the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and faith unfeigned, unhypocritical faith. So you're talking about sound doctrine, doctrines of grace, and people are trying to get away from that teaching other things. Well, that's one of the attacks of Satan is on, on, on the doctrine of grace. The, uh, the contrary doctrine uh, from other than what Paul had taught. Uh, if you look at verse 19, it says, holding faith. Now that's, remember I said when you, the shield of faith, you want to get behind that shield. I'm not sure that's really a shield that you would hold. It might be, well, somebody's got to hold it. So, But it's, it's getting a hold of it. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning the faith have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenius and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So you see Satan's involved in here, or at least the, the things they're teaching is just satanic doctrine. And if these men are, men are going to pursue it, Paul, just like, the, just like the man in 1 Corinthians 5 who was living after the flesh in fornication, Paul delivered him, said, deliver him unto Satan for the destruction of his flesh. When I hear some people teaching false doctrine, Paul said, I delivered him unto Satan. That's his field. That's where, that's where he operates at. And so you see the attack is on faith, us standing behind the truth that God has given us. And uh, um, come to chapter 6. It says in verse 12, Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and has professed a good profession of faith, a good, good profession before many witnesses. Um, so the, there, he tells them to, to fight the good fight of faith. So, you know, fight for the truth of the doctrine. And, uh, and then also he says, lay hold on eternal life. And uh, that, uh, that is, again, get a hold of eternal things that you've been taught and stand there. Uh, even in the same chapter when he talked about the rich, he says... Uh, Uh, verse 17, charge them that are rich in this, in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, which giveth us all thing, uh, uh, get richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. 
So they're going to live and operate for the truth of God's word, but that kind of also kind of blends into this lay hold on eternal life because the helmet, as you go out to battle, is the hope of salvation. And it has to do with Jesus Christ coming and, and no, no matter what happens in this life, we're going to be raptured and, and placed in heavenly places and we need to live with, live with that eternal hope in mind because that frees us from despair, from fear and despair. Certainly warfare would bring all that about and that's part of laying hold on eternal life in this sense. Look again back at chapter 1. And I was with the congregation that got away from the rapture. And I was teaching, and I, I couldn't help but make this connection. And, uh, and so I thought I had the liberty to say anything I want, so naturally I, I said what I, I just had to say. And it went over like it meant nothing. And uh, if it means nothing to do with you, you, you have to let me know, because this means a lot to me. <laughs> but in 1 Timothy, when it says in verse 19, chapter 1, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. Now they have, there's faith and a good conscience. So you believe something and your conscience, of the truth of God's word, connects it. It's right. But if you get rid of a pure conscience, then you can, your faith will become hypocritical. It, it could be something that's not true. I mean, you know, like for instance, I don't know if I share it next hour. There was a preacher came talk to me this week. Another problem. But one of the things I explained to him is he has a different doctrine than our church. And we've talked to him before. He came on a Wednesdays a couple times. I asked him, I says, here's what I mean. I said, which do you teach? I quoted Matthew 6 that uh, if you forgive your brother, your father, your heavenly father will forgive you. If you don't forgive your brother, neither will your heavenly father forgive you. Then I says, but over here in Paul's epistles, he said, we're to forgive one another even as, God, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. I said, which one do you teach? Which one is right? He said, well, both. <laughs> yeah, he's right. One's right for Israel, one's right for us. <laughs> but he didn't mean it that way. He has no conscience about, hey, there's some problem here. His conscience is totally seared. He, did, he didn't care about the truth. And he just wants to keep teaching his congregation. <laughs> Um, so anyhow, these two men put away a good conscience concerning faith. And they've made shipwreck. And one of those men is Hymenaeus. See that? Now come over to 2 Timothy. <clears throat> now, chapter 2, verse 15 tells us, we're to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. By the way, when I showed that verse to that man, he says, no, look at the first part of that. Approved unto God. He says, yeah, but how do you get approved unto God? He wouldn't read the rest of the verse. But anyhow, verse 16 says, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word, this false teaching, these babblings, these vain statements, their word will eat as doth a canker. It just eats away at the truth that destroys people. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. There that guy is again. The things he's teaching is a cancer in, in the body of Christ. Verse 18, look what he's teaching. Who concerning the truth have erred, saying the resurrection is past already and overthrew the faith of some. So, if, if they're teaching the resurrection is past already, now I don't know what all these guys are into. You know, there's people today that teach preterism, that everything in the book of Revelation has been fulfilled. Some of them argue whether Christ already came back or not, because that's part of Revelation. So I don't know how spiritualizing Hymenaeus was teaching, but I got thinking about that verse. If they're teaching the resurrection is past already, if the resurrection is the second coming, you know, the Revelation 19, Jesus Christ comes back, and then he raises the Old Testament saints when he comes back. Well, if they're teaching the resurrection has passed already, then Jesus Christ would have had to been on earth, right? So were they teaching Jesus Christ already came back and the Old Testament saints were already raised? Or were they teaching a resurrection that Paul taught, they're called the rapture, that takes seven years before that, 
and teaching that our resurrection has already taken place, the rapture. Well, it seems to me that, you know, see, people who don't put the rapture as different than the resurrection, well, how would they answer that question? Are these, is everyone so foolish? The whole body of Christ is thinking Jesus Christ is back in Jerusalem reigning and all the Old Testament saints are alive again? Or is that resurrection they were teaching, our resurrection, that we're already, the resurrection took place, that is the rapture's already taken place and we're in the tribulation? And to me, that would be the only way you could confuse anybody. I, I, you know, but of course, Joe witnessed to say, what, he came back in 1918 or something? So I guess you could say the other one. But anyhow, I was looking at that verse thinking, the only way that you could deceive anybody is if there's two different resurrections. The body of Christ and the kingdom saints. And they're not teaching the kingdom saints, otherwise they'd be teaching Jesus Christ is here. So they must be teaching the rapture already took place. Now, come over with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, they be not soon shaken in mind, neither uh, or troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And then he goes into all the things that are going to happen in the tribulation. These people thought that the day of Christ, we, we get raptured at the, at the day of Christ. But they're on earth, and they're thinking the day of Christ has come here, which is now the events that are going to take place, where the Antichrist is going to come and all of that. And Paul's saying, no, that day hasn't come yet. Don't let anyone deceive you. Well, that matches what those other guys were teaching, doesn't it? That the resurrection is past, and we're in the tribulation already. And uh, the Thessalonians, someone wrote them in saying that. So those two things match, which, you know, kind of makes me think that other passage about the resurrection is the same thing that Second Thessalonians is dealing with. Now, whether you follow all that or believe all that, it doesn't matter. What we're pointing out is there was false doctrine being taught, and part of that false doctrine is taking away people from the hope of salvation, from living with the, with the understanding that we're going to be raptured before the wrath comes, and these people are in fear and despair because they think it already, that someone wrote them and said it's already passed. So you see, those are the areas Satan is going to attack your hope, the hope of the rapture. And, uh, and so those are the areas of attack. Now, these parts of the body, the loins is your midsection that's girded, with, with, uh, with the belt of, of truth. And when you talk about your midsection, that's the section of growth. Let, I think I can do all these. Come to flip, uh, Proverbs chapter 31. I might not be able to get through these, but I'll just tell you if I don't. Proverbs 31. The, 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 the account is the virtuous woman. And, uh, and among the things that it said, I just wanted you to see that when you talk about these certain parts of the body, that they represent something. I'll get there. You're probably there. Uh, in verse uh, 17, it says, She girdeth her loins with strength. The belt around your loins gives you that strength. Anytime a weightlifter is going to lift something, he puts that belt as tight as he can, it's for strength. And so you get strength by being girded about with truth. Um, when you put on the breastplate of righteousness, that breastplate is guarding your heart. <laughs> uh, what an important part to guard. Now look at uh, Proverbs chapter 4. Verse 23, it says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Satan wants to attack your heart. Remember, we didn't, one of the things we could have saw in 2 Timothy, 
Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. So your heart is a real important issue when it comes to spiritual things. And the attack of sin is certainly an attack upon your heart, whether you're going to love the Lord and serve the Lord, or whether you're going to love the world and serve your flesh. So, so th those pieces of armor guard certain parts of the body that are important. Shoes are certainly set us to, for your feet, for the, for the purpose of being able to be established and to stand. Go, go to the book before this, Psalms 18. I'm going to start in verse 31. You'll see several of the different things that are said here. He says, uh, well, even verse 1, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so will I be saved from my enemies. So you got David in all the battles that he fought, and so you can see there's, we're in a spiritual warfare. Verse 31 says, Who is God save the Lord? Who is the rock save our God? It is God that girdeth me with strength, there it is again, and maketh my way perfect. He maketh my feet like hinds feet, and setteth me on my high places. He teacheth my hands to war so that the bow of steel is broken uh, by mine arms. Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation, and the right hand hath, thy right hand hath upholded me, uh, hath holded me up, and thy uh, gentleness hath made me, uh, made me great. Thou hast enlarged my steps under me, that my feet did not slip. So you see the, the, the shield and and the girding, and, the, and the, uh, the feet, so he doesn't slip. I pursued my enemies and overtook them. Ne uh, neither did I turn again till thou, they were consumed. I have wounded them that they may not be able to rise. They are fallen under my feet. For thou hast girded me with strength unto the battle. Thou hast uh, subdued under me those that rose up against me. So... David using all these same terms talking about those different things and the feet certainly give stability. So when we talk about standing behind faith and the doctrine, we're talking about the shield of faith is protecting your whole body. Well, when you read in your Bible, why did God give you a body? Present yourselves a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. God wants to use this, this, these bodies, these weakened vessels of ours to bring honor and glory to him by us serving uh, uh, in the doctrine of, of, under grace by faith serving the Lord. And then that helmet of salvation protects our head as you go out to battle certainly the right mind that, that to know that you belong to the Lord and that whatever happens for me to, be, to die is Christ. Uh, to me to live as Christ and to die as gain, to go out and have that kind of mindset in service for the Lord so that uh, the hope that we have protects the mind uh, all the way through life and keeps you focused and looking for, as it says in Colossians, set your affections on things above, not on things in the earth, for your life is hid with Christ in God. So you can play with that as well. Write it down, look at it, meditate on it, and find your own verses as well. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for our class, and we thank you for the teaching uh, of your word. We thank you that we can take even a, a subject of, of, of the mysteries, as Paul says at plural one time, and look at the mystery in several different ways and receive all these teachings and warnings as we uh, consider in this subject the, the mystery of iniquity. Thank you for the truth of your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.